So Maddie and I are sharing a microphone today Mm -hmm. because we are being graced by the presence of one of Canada's best runners in the history of running, particularly an all time great in the marathon, Ms. Lanny Marshall. Welcome to the rundown. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. All the way from London, Ontario. Yeah. And Phoenix, Arizona. And Chattanooga, Tennessee. And Chattanooga, Tennessee. <laughs> I was there this weekend. So. She's a worldly woman. I would love to move to Tennessee one day. If I can find a way to make myself American, don't know how, would love to end up in Tennessee. Chattanooga or Nashville. They're, they're my favorite. Yeah. I've only been to Memphis, but I really enjoyed that. But I've heard unbelievable things about Nashville. And yeah. My life goal is to get there. Mm-hmm. There's some road, hopefully there's, for a race. There's some good road races and you there's race there. Music yeah. City Distance Carnival. That's what you're big raced. fan of that race. Yeah, they give prize money at that race. I know they do. Yeah, <laughs> we we so Maddie and I talked last week about uh, Ekaden relays in Japan mm-hmm. and how you can actually, if you join an Ekaden team, you can call yourself a professional athlete without having to have an asterisk beside it, which is what we have to have, unfortunately, because professional implies that you make money. But <laughs> the great thing is when you attend events like Music City Distance Festival, Carnival. Dave Carnival? Milner. Yeah. He, and he puts on the one in Memphis, too, where you That's can right. also make money. And I have won money there. And mm-hmm. when you win in American dollars, it's even sweeter. Yes, That's it true. is. So thank you again for joining us. Of course. You were in town for a special event today. How was it? Uh, yeah, it was great. I was here for the Can Fund 150 Women uh, second birthday event. And um, a lot of athletes are familiar with Can Fund. It supports um, athletes trying to make national teams. And we all know competing for your country doesn't necessarily pay the bills. So Can Fund has stepped in to try and help alleviate some of those expenses. And then now this initiative is focused just on the women's side. Um, they were talking today just as I was leaving about how initial, like they were noticing a lot of their donors were primarily male and they're like, well, we got to fix this. So now this is women donating and supporting women and female athletes and creating, um, a movement there. So it was really cool to be invited to come up and be one of the female athletes in attendance. That's great. That's that a really good great. concept. And I, I think a lot of people probably don't think about that side of it. Like we have, this is, I know still a, a slightly controversial topic, but I think track and field does a fairly good job of gender equity in terms of, you know, the same payouts at at races for men and women and, you know, the same amount of support at the federal level in Canada, at least, unlike a lot of our partner NSOs. Um, But I never thought about like the the business donor sponsor side. And it makes sense that like most of those would be men. So cool that there's that initiative. Yeah, because when you think about it, a lot of the bigger companies are still male run. And so then if they're making donations, it's it's from the male side and not that we're we're grateful for it. Right. But I think as you're starting to see more women in leadership roles within these companies, now they part of coming part of what comes with that leadership is you also have to be willing to donate. You can't just say you support women in sport. Now like we're we're starting to see enough equality between men and women in these leadership roles where, okay, like support women's sport means supporting it financially as well. Put your money where your, where your mouth is. Yeah. Put your money where your heart is. Right. And, oh, that's great. Um, yeah. So it was a great initiative to be part of today. Well, that is actually a fantastic segue. We are going to talk a lot more about women's leadership. We're going to talk about, um, we're going to get into a little bit of the nitty gritty in a few minutes, um, particularly around some of the conversations that have been had locally, provincially, federally around um, the Mary Kane piece that came out in the New York Times a few weeks ago. We're going to talk about some issues of maltreatment in the sport and how we can move forward from them. But before we get to that light topic, we're going to bring you our regular rundown and we're going to start with the road. Take it away, Maddie. All right. At the Philly Marathon, Dariba Degefa Igezu finished in a 216.31, led from mile seven onward. A long time to lead. <laughs> no kidding. And a nice little finishing time. And the top female was Fene Gameda, who finished in 232.48 and broke the women's course record by three seconds. That was probably a nice payout for uh, three seconds. No kidding. Yeah. And super cool about the Philly Marathon, the Psych on a Bike program. Have you heard of this, Lanny? No, I haven't. So in the loneliest miles of the marathon, which they deemed like 18 to 22, I think. That's when the marathon actually starts, guys. Yeah. Just so you know. Just so so you know. (laughs) I've never experienced it, but yeah, that is what I'm told. And they had five psychologists, sports psychologists on bikes, just doing like rounds of these miles to give people support, like give people like mental cues and help them through that part of the race. 
And like they did it for hours. So it was like for the elites and then it was also for like the back of the Packers. Oh, so they do it for the elites as well. Yeah, yeah. That is amazing. So it's weird because there was like some, you know, there's always going to be trolls about these things, but there was actually some controversy about it because technically you're not allowed to have bikes on a race course because it can be, can be considered like pacing. Yeah. As long as they're keeping a certain distance. Right. Um, it would be, it'd be fine because they do have lead cyclists and motorcyclists for the elites in races regularly. Mm-hmm. Um, so you could make the same argument there. So as long as these sports psychs are abiding by the rules. Um, I don't see why there would be any real issue for it. Or- well, I think overall it was really well received. Yeah. And it yeah. sounds like it had actually been piloted at a couple duathlons in the past mm-hmm. in the U.S. Yeah. And so I think this was the first like major marathon that they were having this program roll out at. But it sounds like it's going to move forward pretty steadily because it was a huge success. People were really into it. It, it makes so, so much cool. sense. Well, I feel like at that point it's – I've never done it. But I feel like it's a lot in your mind at that point, how how bad you want to hurt. Yeah. it's. Uh, <laughs> I always tell um, people when they're entering into road races that when you when it starts to hurt, when it starts, you, don't, you start to think you can't keep going, um, count to 10. Because usually by then, that, pa- that moment of pain that you're going through is past, mm-hmm. or you've at least bought yourself 10 more seconds of running before you <laughs> stop or slow down. Um, and that there's been plenty of time in a marathon where I've spent the last like – 10 to 12 K counting to 10 the entire time. <laughs> Sometimes I'll switch it up and count backwards, but you usually just go one to 10 and then reassess one to 10. Reassess. Did you ever watch the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt? Yes. That Netflix show. So she, she's like a mole woman. So she's like kept underground by this crazy guy who thinks the apocalypse is coming. And he, anyway, it's, it is a comedy, but <laughs> she, she has to turn this crank day after day after day to keep like the place going. Mm-hmm. And so her whole mantra is you can do anything for 10 seconds. So she turns it and like she, and she counts and she, by the time she gets to eight, she's like eight, nine, 10 and then like one starts over so I kind of like that and yeah. it's like you can do you can endure anything for 10 seconds yeah. it works um it's and it's simple so cool well maybe we need like Lanny's on bikes once she's retired <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> like elites on bikes we can come up elites with a snappier bikes, title but well, yeah. that's kind of fun yeah okay Canadian results at the Philly half well Philly half and full mm-hmm. we had some great performances on our women's side Leslie Sexton with the 111 half Big yeah. PB, almost a two, almost two full minute PB, mm-hmm. um, and I, I'm really happy to see this because she had to pull out of Scotia. She did the Road to Hope half mm-hmm. and ran well, but not I think as fast as she would have wanted. Um, and then yeah, had this amazing turnaround. Well, another thing, she's moved to Kingston now with her partner, and they London Runner, their group has joined Physical. So now they have what they're calling like PK London and PK Kingston. So I don't know if they're trying to do like a mile to marathon situation, Mm -hmm. but they want to like grow the club running scene. And they're also now on staff of Queen's University. They're both assistant coaches. Cool. So that's that's a very cool life change. Also, speaking of London, no, speaking of Kingston people, Cleo Mm -hmm. Boyd Mm -hmm. was, what was she, fifth? In 114.23, it was a marginal PB, mm-hmm. but I think the conditions were really rough. So for these women to run this fast, very good, be great. No, oh, it's exciting to see what's coming up in the so ranks. So many good marathoners. And adding to that conversation in her debut, Anne-Marie Camo, who just medaled at U Sport Cross. Two weeks ago. Mostly a cross-country skier. Wow. Yeah, right. 241, 241 debut. Pretty strong. Yeah. After like... And that cross-country race was not a chill cross-country race. It was, like, terrible weather. (laughs) So it was very, very impressive. And, like, Leslie was even saying after the race, she was like, I don't think Olympic standards is getting you to the Olympics in the marathon. So she was like, I think I have Olympic standard in me. Does that mean I'm making the team? Absolutely not, (laughs) which is very cool because everyone uh, lost their minds when those standards came out. Yeah, let's get a quick read from Lanny on – the Olympic standards and how much they were lowered this year. Like, so we talk a lot about how they obviously were just blown out of the water in terms of like, we've never seen a drop this big with a world standard before Mm -hmm. or an Olympic standard. And yet to Maddie's point, like our girls have been turning up. Yeah. (laughs) Like they're turning up in huge numbers. What were your thoughts when you saw the standards and then like, has that shifted or changed at all as we've progressed? Well, I'd say, um, 
on the, at least on, I can speak to the marathon side and the 10,000 a little bit, but on the marathon side, we as Canadians have seen drops in the times like this, uh, you know, like the standard has always been quick on the Canadian side. So for when the IAAF and the IOC drops the standard down, it, it, there wasn't this, I didn't feel the same panic because it was kind yeah. of that mindset of this is what we've been having to do for Olympic cycle after Olympic cycle after Olympic cycle. Mm -hmm. What's exciting is I remember going into the 2016 games and doing talks and doing pressers, et cetera, and saying, I want it to be difficult to make the 2020 team. I didn't mean for the IAAF to come and make the standard difficult for everybody. I meant for Krista, DeShane, and I to help inspire and motivate women across Canada to, to go for these times and to show them they're attain obtainable. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually proud that I'm like having to eat those words and that, you know, I didn't anticipate being injured and sick for the last three years, but even healthy, even if I hadn't have had the hardships that I've had these last couple of years, I would not be going into this next Olympic year confident that I was going to make the team. 2016, it was pretty much who else is going to get in my way. This time it's, oh my gosh, like AC has actually stepped back and it's just going to allow whichever top three women run themselves onto the team. Yeah. And even outside the marathon, we're seeing that. We're seeing our milers, 1500 meter runners, our 3K steeplers, 800 meter runners, like Melissa Bishop's been out and the rest of the women have stepped up and said, okay, like, here we go. <laughs> we're, you know, we're going to carry this torch. Uh, and so it's a really exciting time to be part of women's running. And then as someone coming from my background, when I've been at the top and now I'm going to have to really not even battle myself back, but I'm battling some really aggressive talent out there and it's, it's inspiring and exciting. Great mm -hmm. words. Oh, I have chills. I <laughs> it's funny. Anytime someone who like isn't in our sport asks me this question, oh, well, like, you know, where do you stand in the rankings and how hard do you think it's going to be to make the Olympics? I always say that. I'm like, I don't think it's the times because quite frankly, I think I should be running those times if I want to be competitive at the games. Mm -hmm. It's all the other competition that we have. <laughs> it's our depth right now. And that's great. Like to your point, I want it to be that way. I want yeah. to like earn my spot on that team because I had to go up against and also be like buoyed by yeah. other women who are doing just you have badass to be the things. best of the best to make the teams um, right now, and hopefully that carries forward for the future. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, like even when I went to Rio, like I was the best Lanny I could be in Rio, and all that's going to happen is if I'm fortunate enough to get my body back and run a fast enough time to make Tokyo, I'm going to be astronomically better than the 2016 Lanny just because I've had to be that much better to claw my way onto the 2020 team. That's so great. I can't wait. <laughs> it's very exciting. We talk all the time about how nervous we are that like the Olympics are just around the corner. But now I feel like that nerve, like that anxiety has shifted to just like, Amped I don't us. know, I'm jazzed. Oh, I'm jazzed. It was even it was even crazy to like run the times I ran this summer and I was like any other year a standard for the Olympics yeah. <laughs> not even world standard we continue nope. like, it was just like, like these marks are different it was yeah. like this is a meaningless time now yeah. <laughs> be better yeah it's yeah. great on to the cross country course we had the NCAA cross country championships which were not held on the road <laughs> Unlike yeah, they weeks. moved him back to the field yeah. in Terre Haute, Indiana, and um, they, it sounds like they didn't get nearly as much snow as Buffalo got for the Northeast Regional Championships mm -hmm. last weekend. However, it was still wet, sloppy, and cold. Yeah, super gross. That's but what I it's mean, supposed to be. Yeah, that's kind yeah. of the Midwest in late November. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's supposed to be cross country. Right. It's true cross. It's yeah. not just like running around and, you know, 20 degree sun on a golf course. No. No. It's so tough. that is fun. It is. Yeah. Going to school in Tennessee, I did enjoy that aspect of American cross yeah. country. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably why it made me soft and I don't do cross country anymore. <laughs> when was the last time you raced cross? Um, On a whim in 2015. And when I texted my coach asking if I should do it, his response back was, are you drunk right now? <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, No. Well, maybe, yeah. but <laughs> crazy, but <laughs> but I mean it. Yeah, but like there was no Ekadin that year. There was no cheap uh, Ekadin, and I was like, well, why not? Yeah, and beer is delicious, and it's telling me to do this. Right. So. <laughs> uh, this is a controversial statement in this room, but I honestly cannot wait to get back to cross country when I'm done my competitive track and road career. And I think I'm probably alone in this tree. I will. Of I will. Yeah. I, I have no interest ever. 
I ran it for five years. I didn't like it any of those years. It got longer every mm-hmm. year I did it. That's when they were <laughs> in the process of going from five to eight K. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I was not a fan, but uh, it uh, it made me strong. Yes. Yeah. And maybe I'm just seeing it through rose colored glasses. But anyway, lots of people ran incredibly well. Those Arkansas women, oh, holy so smokes. impressive! And even BYU for second, yeah, highest scoring second place team in uh, NCAA history. Yeah, it was tight. Yeah, super tight. Or sorry, lowest scoring, right. lowest scoring NCAA right. team. Right, right, highest yeah. placing, lowest scoring. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the Arkansas w- women won, and this made them only the second team in D one NCAA history to win a triple crown in one year. So they were the indoor NCAA champions, the outdoor NCAA champions, and now the cross country champs. Wow, I didn't know that. That's amazing. And I think it was like the early 80s the last time we saw this happen on the women's side. It's insane depth on one team. No kidding. Across the board. Yeah. Um, On the men's side, BYU. Mm -hmm. Huge upset. Huge upset. And a long time coming for them. And then like including Canadian Rory Linkletter, a lot of their big guns graduated. So they thought it would be kind of a weak, a weak team this year, but weak it was not. No, no, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And speaking of Canadians, it was kind of a mixed bag. Yeah, it was a bit of a mixed Canadian bag. But again, Rory graduated, Charlotte Prowse graduated, right. Justin Knight's no longer in the NCAA, and those were like our big Canadian heavy hitters for a while. Yeah, that's true. I would say our standout was Ehab El Sandali, and he was achingly close to being an All-American. Yeah. So as Lanny knows, in the NCAA, an All-American at Cross is placing in the top 40. He mm-hmm. was 41st. Oh, jeez. An amazing position. I mean, well, for a little context for our like listeners who don't follow the NCAA Cross very closely, if you can crack that top 50, you're in elite company. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had a number of our Canadians finish kind of like close to 100 or, you know, 110, 120th. But there was also a tweet, I think it was Steve Magnus put it out, who was like, uh, just to throw a controversial stat out there. And then he started listing all the people who had gone on to have unbelievable pl- pro careers who never cracked the top 100 at the NCAA cross. So oh, he was sure. like, there's definitely, you know, great for you if you did it, but also if you didn't, take solace in the fact that it doesn't necessarily dictate anything. It's not a direct correlation, no. 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 So that was uh, Ihab El Sandali, again, plays 41st for his Iona team. Um, I doubt we'll see any of our Canadians come back and race Canadian cross. Karen O'Neill is. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so is Shauna McCullough. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So I am eating my words. Good Mm -hmm. for them. (laughs) So, of course, our Canadian ACXC championships are being held in Abbotsford, BC in a few short days. Mm Mm-hmm. Maddie Kelly will be covering it. I will be. Actually, exciting mashup will be Taryn O'Neill and the Offset champ, Abby Uaz, who like oh, yeah. just straight up ran away from the field. That's right. Uh, so she really hasn't had any competition yet this season. And so it'll be cool to have Taryn come home, race on like basically her home course and see of the two of them who comes out on top. Fun showdown. Mm-hmm. Everyone's got to love a good showdown. So it's great because our cross-country conversation kind of moves really nicely into our final piece of news, which is on the trail, mm-hmm. which is, so Tori Schultz, our trail editor, wrote this great piece. I encourage you all to go check it out. We'll link it in the show notes to this story. Um, but she basically talks about how trail runners, and I'm not just talking like no disrespect to 25K trail runners, but I'm not just talking about the shorter distances, but like long distance ultra trail runners are starting to clean up on the cross-country course. And the main example that she uses is this British runner, Tom Evans, who is not only a world-class 100 miler, in fact, he podiumed at Western States, again, arguably the most prestigious and competitive Mm -hmm. 100 miler, Uh, but he also just uh, qualified for the European cross-country championships, which is incredibly deep and really hard to qualify for, and it's a 10K. So we're comparing, like, let's see, it took him, I think, just under 15 hours to podium in a hundred miler yeah. and 31 minutes mm-hmm. to qualify in a 10 K. Those are different distances. Yeah. And like, yeah, that's so, range. <laughs> totally. And her whole point was like, yeah, okay. There's some like terrain similarities. There's strength building opportunities that are like, you can imagine there'd be some crossover, <laughs> but in terms of time on your feet that's and like, like fast twitch, short or fast twitch, slow twitch muscle like recruitment, it's completely different. That's like proportionately being good at the 60 hurdles and the marathon. 
That's a great yeah. way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you thinking of taking up a new distance, Lanny? Oh, you mean taking up some hurdles? Yeah. No, thanks. Good for your foot speed. Yeah, I'll it's pass. True. Yeah. I did steeple, but. You did steeple. I was conference champion in my freshman year at UT Chattanooga. Steeplechase. Ended up with a ton of stress fractures that summer. After. Oh, <laughs> that's what I. That's what I hear. Yeah, Word yeah. on the street is your first year steeple stuff. Yeah, and well, like that was only the second year. It was an NCAA event, so the girls that were actually good at it hadn't figured that out yet. Mm. So I'm just a workhorse. Like I could just run pretty much my 3k speed. Mm-hmm. The same going over barriers, and then I drown in the water pit, and then I get out of it. Like I didn't clear the water; I just went swimming and came trudging out. It wasn't pretty, but my like I I was steady, mm-hmm. and I could just like pick the girls off. Um, but if you looked at my actual three k time at the time, I think I was a ten thirty three k girl, mm-hmm. and I was a ten fifty steepler. Like I wasn't mm. great at either. <laughs> Well, if you ever decide to go back to the cross country course, I must say, having raced world cross country a couple times, because they're almost always um, like man made courses, your steepling skills would come in handy <laughs> because it's often on like a fairly flat course. Mm-hmm. And to make it more challenging, they'll roll in like logs for you oh, to have geez. like obstacles essentially. It becomes like an obstacle course. So you could use your, your, Long lost steepling skills. Yeah. Maybe yeah, that's thanks. why Jen's so good at cross country. Oh, I totally believe that's oh, yeah. true. Yeah. 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 There's like nothing that girl can't clear. That's true. <laughs> uh, a couple of Canadians who also fall into that sort of trail cross country mashup are Alex Ricard, who we've talked about a lot on the show. Um, he usually competes on the trail and he's also a stellar mountain runner. He'll be racing on Saturday as well. Rob Watson, TTR. Rob Watson. Rob Watson feels like a reluctant member of this cross country race but uh he said he thinks he's gonna get his ass kicked uh he's entering because miles marathon was short a member but you know he's podiumed many a time so yeah. from the front mm-hmm. yeah, from exactly. the front. yeah so he's excited to relive his national cross country glory days i love the camaraderie that's great <laughs> so make sure to follow along with runningmagazine.ca and all of our social feeds because Maddie Kelly and Anne Francis will be bringing you all the live updates from beautiful Abbotsford, BC this Saturday, November 30th. Also, my niece's eighth birthday. Happy birthday, Charlotte. I joined Nike because I wanted to be the best female athlete ever. Instead, I was emotionally and physically abused by a system designed by Alberto and endorsed by Nike. So, of course, what you just heard was a clip from Mary Kane speaking in the video that she released as part of her New York Times op-ed. This has, of course, been widely circulated. I think almost all of our listeners are at least aware of the situation with Mary Kane and NOP and Alberto Salazar. I'd like to start by asking each of you just to kind of give your thoughts on what went through your head and your heart when you saw and read that piece. It's about time. That's kind of what went through my mind. I know myself, you, a lot of us have been vocal about our experiences in sport and the NCAA system, uh, my experiences growing up in the figure skating world, um, what I experienced kind of in my Olympic level running as well. And it just, it's things all, you know, the timing of things really matters. And Mary Kane coming forward and her being so young and so willing to speak up about it. um, And you know, in the threat of Me Too and in the threat of safe sport and maltreatment in sport, it was just, it was ripe at this moment. And um, so, yeah, for me, I like, I feel for her and I feel for every athlete that's had to go through what she's gone through. Um, and yeah, the, my, but my first thought was, it's about time. It's about time. Not that it was said, because like I said, it's been said before, but it's about time that people were willing to listen and that it had such an impact Um, and right away, like out out the gates, people were listening and it started the conversation. Well, and about the conversation, I had more talks that week with my coaches, with other members of the running community, with casual fans than I had ever in my life about body image and about this sort of like culture in our sport of weight loss and the sort of the race to the bottom with thinner is faster. 
And I think that obviously the it was initially shocking to hear her story, just the severity of it. Mm-hmm. But the underlying theme we were all aware of. Yeah. And the conversations that came of it, I think, are so, so positive. So Maddie, and again, we'll link this in the write up to this story. But Maddie, you actually wrote an article for our magazine, um, kind of outlining putting yourself in the first person and outlining outlining your experiences um, with your coaching staff. And again, some of your responses to this piece. And one of the things that you wrote, and you and I talk about this all the time, is that I've never felt outside pressure to lose weight, compete when injured, or do anything for a coach that jeopardizes my emotional or physical safety. It's unfortunate that I have to say I consider myself lucky. What I've experienced shouldn't be exceptional. It should be the standard. We talk about that a lot. I mean, I'm in a very similar boat. I have, I counted it actually. I've worked with over 10 coaches in my two decades in track and field, and all of them have been men, and all of that, all of them have been phenomenal human beings, incredible coaches very supportive. And I've had very similar situations to you. But of course, we know that's not true for everyone. Lanny, do you mind sharing some of your experiences? I mean, all three of us currently have male primary primary coaches who are male. And I think all three of us are pretty happy with our current training situations. Do you mind speaking a bit to your experience sort of past and present with your coaches? Yeah. So I think the important thing like this, we're, you know, this is a running podcast. We're talking about running, but running is not the only sport. Um, So my initial introduction to um, Smaller is Better was figure skating, where we were weighed every week and fat tested every month. And it was put up on the board and an asterisk was put beside your name if you were under 9.5% body fat as a girl. Um, And that was like a a gold star. That was gold star. That was you were a lean, mean, lean and mean machine is what they would put it up there as. And you were weighed in front of your teammates, you were fat tested in front of your teammates and your coaches and everybody walking down through that corridor could see it. Uh, so I went from that eating disordered sport with an eating disorder into athletics. And I was fortunate that my club coach, Dave Mills, I'm still with him. He's been my coach since I was about 15. Um, never put any pressure on me about my weight or body size. Um, would step in, um, with other athletes when things kind of looked like they were going the wrong way in terms of they are, you know, harming themselves. Uh, I can't say my NCAA experience was as positive. Um, we weren't overtly weighed or fat tested. So in my brain, it was okay because like that I recognized as abusive. I didn't recognize being told I'm looking a little too healthy was very much the same culture. Oh yeah. People, people don't realize uh, healthy means you're chubby. Means fat. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I've said this before and I actually remember, remember having this conversation with Leslie Sexton mm-hmm. and her saying that it, it stuck in her brain as like a good metric for her to recognize like, you know, how messed up women and girls can get in sport. And cause Mm -hmm. she is very involved with London runner and with coaching and with her, with her own training. Mm -hmm. But I remember my mindset being, um, if I had one period, I was slipping. If I had two periods in a row, I was fat. And that was from when I went through puberty, which I went through puberty late. <laughs> I think I was like 17 years old, mm-hmm. um, cause of figure skating. But by then I'm in athletics and as much as my club coach wasn't pushing it, my internal pressure and my brain working the way it did, I was always so afraid to get my period because to me that meant my body was healthy. It mm-hmm. meant I had enough fat stores that I could now have a period. And that was absolutely failing in in my in my world and my my view of being a successful athlete. So, it, man, there's so much to unpack. I feel like that it's interesting that you were actually. I think what I, what I'm getting at here is that culture matters so much, and what we talk about when we talk about this conversation frequently is like the how sport culture gets ingrained, and we know that it happens generally from your first exposure. And that's not to say that it can't start out great and turn into something more negative, which was your experience, Lanny. But it's so interesting when I hear that you actually had a club coach at 15 who was very supportive and provided some of those pillars for you. And even you with those pillars of support early on still found yourself in a culture that was indoctrination really in a lot of ways around what was considered good. And the fact that healthy and good were not synonymous (laughs) is... I mean, so messed up in so many levels. So one of the things that I think is also really important in this conversation is that 
and you've both kind of said this, we already push ourselves so much. I mean, especially as female athletes, I think you learn pretty early on as well that lighter does mean faster for a time. And it's really hard at a young age to have the scope of perspective to say that this isn't sustainable, but all you see are the immediate results. So if you're getting rewarded for really uh, unhealthy behaviors, you're going to keep doing it. We're driven. We want to get the best out of ourselves. We're going to do everything we can to improve. We already have that compass that probably doesn't point towards healthy very often. <laughs> We've talked about this again, Maddie. We don't need an outside force telling us to do these unhealthy things, to engage in these unhealthy practices. Most of us do it ourselves anyway. And so I think one of the important elements of this talk is that not only do we not need coaches to tell us to lose weight, sometimes we actually need them to be our guideposts to tell us not to engage in the practices that we're doing on our own. And, you know, that's a big part of the conversation around safe sport is that it used to be a term that was considered harassment or abuse, and it's now been brought in to include mal maltreatment. And maltreatment includes things that are a little bit less nefarious, like neglect. So it's not always that there's a coach out there saying, you need to lose weight, or I'm going to you know, weigh you in front of your teammates all the time and body shame you. Sometimes we actually just need a coach to pull us back from our own negative behaviors. Have you had coaches that have been able to do that for you, Lanny? Yeah, like I think the the fact that now we're looking at things and calling it maltreatment is hugely important because again, in my like I I now know looking back at my skating career when I was younger and my collegiate experience that being screamed at going into dressing room number 6 as a figure skater was a death sentence. Like you were going in to just come out sobbing and feeling like you were the smallest thing in the world. What does that mean? Um, dressing room six is where you would go in and the head coach at our skating club would just berate you. And it was every worst thing that you could, like the, the most heinous things you could say to a person, to an athlete, to a 13 year old girl. Like, um, and it wasn't just the girls, the, the pair guys would go in and get, um, get it as well. Uh, fortunately that coach isn't coaching in Canada anymore. Um, and then in the collegiate system, being like, again, being put on the spot in front of your teammates, uh, just being made to feel like you're completely worthless. Uh, now I can look back and say, yes, that was, there was verbal abuse. There was emotional abuse. There's psycho psychological ab abuse. Uh, but then when I think of the times where I didn't run well, or I was, I had a stress fracture cause I was starving myself not to have a period. And the coach wouldn't, my, my college coach just straight up wouldn't talk to me for three months. So that's where I've had to learn maltreatment and neglect and, you know, not having that support system there. And even with your own teammates, because if they were your, your friends and uh, befriended you during those times, then they risked being on the outs with their coaches. And that's where um, I've been fortunate again with my current coach and who was my club coach through high school. There wasn't any of that. There was mean girling that went on. Um, and I don't think, I think there needs to be some education there for coaches to recognize kind of the different personalities in sport and some of the bullying that can happen teammate to teammate. Uh, but in terms of coach to athlete, I was very fortunate in my high school career. Um, the book ends <laughs> um, uh, between that. Um, and my since then, my professional career, I'm still with my high school coach. So I've been very, very fortunate there. But again, like, I shouldn't count myself fortunate because I've had a very, very decent and amazing man mm -hmm. leading my career with me or beside me. Um, I should be able to, I, in, a, in a perfect world, an athlete should be able to say from start to finish, I felt respected through the whole process. Mm -hmm. And I think changing the language in safe sport to maltreatment, there's a, there should be, the goal is that. Well, and I think that one of the things I've heard from coaches who I've spoken to as well is that they feel like they should have stepped in earlier in a lot of these cases where they don't think um, that they themselves have encouraged eating disorders. They think they've promoted a safe culture on their team. They, in their minds, have done a good job coaching. But the thing that they regret 
is sometimes not knowing how to com- have the conversation and not feeling like they had the resources to have the conversation and then appropriately follow up. Mm-hmm. Because it's not a coach's job to be a nutritionist or a physiologist or a doctor or a sports psychologist. It's their job to be a coach. But they do have to either have the resources or find the resources to provide to the athlete for these other parts of their mm-hmm. physical and mental health. Because you're not you're not just coaching a kid. You're doing a lot more than that. And especially at the collegiate level when they're away from their parents and they don't have that sort of like guidance and check-in anymore, these dangerous habits can start quickly and perpetuate themselves because the truth is they're probably not the only kid on their team who's thinking this way and behaving this way. Mm -hmm. You never wanted to be the last girl on the cross country team to order your dinner when the whole team went Mm -hmm. out because the first girl would order like normal food like a normal meal. Then the next girl would order the same thing, but like no cheese. And then the next girl. And so by the time you're the last girl, you're getting lettuce leaves and water. Yeah. Because like, and I I remember having this conversation because now like I'm very open about it. And I've been talking about this since I set the record or the previous record um, because I recognized the platform I had. And I also recognized I didn't look like most marathon runners should in quotations look like when I ran my 228 Mm -hmm. and I was like great let me show you women like what you can look like doing it and I remember having the conversation that I used to order salad no dressing no croutons no cheese I friggin love cheese (laughs) like now I'm just mad at myself for the friggin decade I didn't allow myself to Mm -hmm. eat it but it was pressure from my teammates pressure from coaches at various phases of my life uh, for young women, we deal with the pressures of society and what's beautiful out there and fad diets and everything. So when you're an, when you're a coach and you have an athlete in front of you and they're struggling, like A, they're probably not the only one on the team. And B, the even if you are the coach doing everything right, you have to understand there's at least 19 other pressures on that athlete to that's created these bad habits. And I think that's where some of the like sustainability piece comes into, because again, like being underweight, having low body fat composition, being really thin, so often works for a very short time. But I think one of two things happens. If you do that long enough, either your body just breaks down, as you mentioned, stress fractures, amenorrhea, there's all these, you know, very physical negative impacts, but it's also the psychological piece. So when you are constantly depriving yourself Maddie Kelly, a happy runner is a fast runner. I mean, that is so true. And that doesn't mean that you can just go and have donuts for every meal, you know, day and night when you're in competition season. Of course, there needs to be some balance and some focus on um, on nutrition. But yeah, like a constant state of deprivation is bad for the body and it's bad for the mind. And even if you're looking at it just from a pure result standpoint, it's not sustainable and it's not going to turn out the kind of athletes that we need. So also, I wanted to just mention quickly the point you brought up, Maddie, about how a coach is not a sports psychologist and a dietitian and a manual therapist. I mean, they may, if you're lucky, be one of those things. And like, I'm talking about having like qualified training and certification in one of those areas, but that is not their responsibility, nor should it be. So I think when we're talking about the neglect piece, again, it's not always coaches intentionally trying to harm athletes, but I think one of the best things that coaches can do is not take on roles that they're not qualified for Mm -hmm. because it's real. You're going to listen to your coach. Our coach is usually, again, our guidepost for almost everything in our sport. So if they're the ones telling you what you should be putting in your body or what you should look like, or, you know, how you should be thinking and feeling about it, if they're not qualified to provide that information and that guidance, they're doing way more harm than good. Um, to bring it back around to Mary, the Mary Kane story, Salazar doesn't have any of those certifications. Right. And yeah, I guess I think Nike had some nutritionists on staff, et cetera. But A, you're dealing with a, a teenage girl whose body's not done developing. Mm-hmm. And um, you're dealing with someone who's really impressionable. And even some of the pros who were older than Mary and went through the system and were you know, chewed up and spat out by that program say the same thing, like, but you, this innate desire to please. And that if, you know, I, I think I know what I'm doing is wrong and is, is harmful and it's going to hurt me, but like he's gold standard, that team, that club is gold standard Mm -hmm. and we can all, you know, jump on the Nike hate train or the Salazar hate train right now. But I think what we're seeing is 
you know, the timing of things, like I said already, that this is now just the, the, the gold star of what's gone wrong. But you can look at, at multiple other clubs and sponsored teams and coaches where athletes and support staff and even, you know, other coaches within that that dynamic are sitting there going like, I think this is wrong, mm-hmm. but like, I don't want to lose my job. Mm-hmm. I don't want to lose my spot on the team. Like everybody for some stupid reason, us as athletes feel like we're replaceable. Sport doesn't exist without us. Right. And as soon as we start recognizing that our coaches, our massage therapists, our nutritionists work for us, mm-hmm. we're the bosses. We're hi- we're hiring them to get us to the next level. Fine. We're the workhorse, but we're the boss. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, athletes have seen themselves as a commodity where we're luxury items. We, we should be top of the line. And it's unfortunate that it's it's taken the Mary Kane story for people to kind of realize that, you know, it wasn't just she was weak and she got fat and she couldn't hack it in, you know, a, a very tough sporting world. And where were her parents and da, 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 da. No, 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 no. Like, that's not the conversation we should be having. The conversation is the group think. We saw how many of her teammates reach out and so, even Cam Levins, Canadian, yeah. Yeah. don't go, I saw what they were doing to you and I will forever feel sorry that I didn't do anything, but I know going forward, I will not sit quiet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it just shows like it's shattering that that group think and that mm-hmm. dynamic that I think bad coaches and bad people have been capitalizing on yeah. for generations. And I think they've been able to capitalize for so long because a lot of these athletes are young. A lot of these athletes, when they experience the worst time in their career, with a few exceptions, Nike Oregon Project being one of those when older athletes spoke out, but Mary, when it started, was young. You, when you were in the NCAA, you're young. These collegiate athletes who are promising but seen as disposable are young when they're in the throes of this system. And I think they're mismanaged. And I think that it takes a long time for them to realize that they are because they have no contact. They don't know anything else. Yeah. So how are you supposed to know that it can be better if you've only known this side? Right. You come to expect in sport, um, unfortunately, and I, I say you, but I, I'll say me. I did. I came to expect in sport, especially through my skating and my NCAA experiences, that if I screwed up on something like it'd be normal to get yelled at or have a water bottle thrown at my head or, you know, something like that. And then I'm in court as a full-time attorney and I, I misspeak or I screw up on a case. And I, you know, like, obviously there's consequences to an error, but like nobody yelled at me. Nobody made me feel like I was, you know, a loser and a failure and I had no business being a lawyer. That's when my brain started to switch over and go, oh, but how many um, with – there was a, a, the big safe sports survey that went out across Canada um, to current and, you know, retired athletes. And we had the, the response rates of the retired athletes were the ones that were more interesting, at least to me, mm-hmm. because they've now gone on into the real world and have had experiences that have let them sit back and reflect and go, I, I did suffer abuse. Mm-hmm. To me, it was so normalized. I suffered abuse until I was working at a marketing firm and I – screwed up in front of a client and there weren't water bottles flying across from at my face. Like it's, yeah. it's amazing the culture that mm-hmm. we've come to accept in sport and we need more Mary Canes and Cam Levins to come out and say, I, I experienced this and the other people to come out and say, I watched this happen and I want to be the people to help change it. Yeah. Well said. And this is a narrative that we hear all the time and it is infuriating to me that it often takes the lack of abuse or the absence of abuse to realize that you were undergoing it at all, Mm -hmm. right? Because we don't have that vision when it is so deeply ingrained in our culture. So I want to move forward to something a little more positive. Um, And it's a big question and we've all started touching on it, but it's sort of where do we go from here and how do we address some of this? I think one of the things that's also come up through all of this is that weight and body composition to a degree are important markers within professional sport. It would be, again, naive to say that we could all sit around just eating McDonald's <laughs> three meals a day and perform well. And personally, I think that comes down to nutrition and the quality of what you're putting in your body from an inflammatory perspective and all of that, instead of just what a number on a scale says or a DEXA scale or a you know a caliper says. Um, but 
of course, it's important to acknowledge that weight is important, but we need to do that in responsible ways. Um, safe sport's been a great start. I think this conversation is a great start. They're being had all over the country and all over the world. But what more do we need to do moving forward, do you guys think, to help foster a change in sport culture in Canada? Because we've all acknowledged that that's what the problem is. It's a sporting culture issue. I think university programs need more resources for these things. I think that it's getting better. But I was, you know, Jen Saigo did an interview with me who's the one of the nutrition heads at Athletics Canada. And she knows that there are lots of Canadian programs without a dedicated nutritionist. Mm -hmm. And I don't know this for sure, but in my own experience, there was a time when there was not a dedicated sports psychologist. Um, you know, we're very on top of the manual therapy, or at least they were in my program, which is great. But just knowing your program has these resources dedicated to you, I think in and of itself sends a message that this is just as important as your physical therapy. This is just as important as showing up to practice in ways I think more important. Mm -hmm. And then also an emphasis from coaches that um, the age of particularly, I'm speaking primarily about collegiate runners because I think that's one of the most vulnerable groups for this topic. And then that carries into your post-collegiate if you have one career. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, I was given, I, I got the skin folds done when I was in university. I went up to the hub. We had it all done. I've never seen those scores. Mm -hmm. No one showed me because they didn't, it didn't matter. They were achieving a baseline for me going forward. But as a 20 year old, it did not matter what my, what my body fat percentage was. And I'm so thankful for that. And just coaches remembering that they can certainly do more harm than good in the four or five years that they have with this athlete and building programs that are based on longevity and not on immediate results. Yeah. And thankfully in Canada, I think we have more room to do – actually, this is kind of a double-edged sword. Our programs aren't money makers in Canada. These positions are not well paid. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's as much of an emphasis on results which is unfortunate for the coaches of those programs in terms of their careers, but I think can be beneficial for the athlete yeah. because the coach in theory should have less pressure. Whereas in the NCAA, these are programs that make money. They're very high turnover of coaches and it's very easy for that person if they don't have a performing team to mm -hmm. lose their job. I'll just duck in quick and say that one of um, I'm so grateful that I had parents who were uh, knowledgeable and so involved in my collegiate decision making process, because one of the questions that my dad had the foresight to ask Kevin Germain when I applied to Duke University was, is your salary directly tied to the performance year to year of your team? And his answer was no. And not to say that every salary tied coach is going to inherently mistreat their athletes. But I think the cases must be higher because there's more on the line. Um, even in the NCA, track and field coaches, which is a non-revenue sport, are not highly paid. They're not, for the most part, rolling in it. Um, but I mean, if you're supporting a family and all of that, I can see why there would be an impetus to maybe cut some corners or push things a little too far with your athletes. So if there are any uh, athletes listening who are looking to apply to the NCAA, it's a question worth asking because it definitely paid off in my case. It's just uh, a good thing to keep in mind. Well, and I think that's part of it too, is educating high school runners on what they should be looking yeah. for in a coach. Because Lanny, to your point, if you're the boss yeah, and ostensibly you're hiring this coach, then why, why wouldn't you sit there in an interview, which is kind of what the recruiting process is, and ask these questions that are going to best suit your interests and serve your interests. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's so hard as a 17-year-old to know that you're vetting someone yeah. who's going to have this very big emotional, physical presence in your life. Yeah. And I think if we can continue to educate athletes to advocate for themselves, that'll also be beneficial going forward. Yeah, yeah. I do think the NCAA system in particular – is the where that relationship is switched because if you're running on scholarship, you're now like the school is your boss. Yeah. Um, so that's why like you should be vetting the coaches better because you're you do feel when you're going for those um, school trips and, and campus visits yeah. that they're sussing you out. But if you go in with the mindset, young athletes listening, <laughs> that you're sussing them out, that you know, like it might be your A school and unfortunately it's not a good fit with the coach. Like it's tough 
but find there is better out there. Um, and we're seeing, and there's, you know, starting to be a few more female NCAA coaches. And I'm not saying that by nature of just being female makes them a good coach and that they don't fall into this trap Mm because I think we all have a few female coaches in our brains that, um, we know we're just as bad as some of the, the top male coaches, but in the professional ranks, Absolutely. And even in the club level, you are paying that club to be a member. Yeah. As a professional, you're paying your coach. That's where you absolutely have a say mm-hmm. in how you're treated and what you what you do. Um, in terms of what where we go from here, um, as much as I was an athlete as a teenager and in my 20s, like purposely doing everything to my body to miss a period, once I turned pro, I never did. Maybe too much, too, too much information for people out there, but I didn't. So when people were looking for female, but I had all the fractures mm-hmm. and I was losing my hair and I was losing my eyebrows and I was sick a lot, especially the Olympic year, unfortunately. Um, educating people that female triad syndrome now, which is only part of relative energy deficiency syndrome, yeah. you can't just ask a girl, are you getting your period? Because most of them are on birth control to force a period. Yeah. You have to start looking and educating yourselves on the other signs, um, depression, impaired judgment, you know, foggy brain, foggy memory, poor sleep cycles, injury, injuries, propensity. like there's so much more to a malnourished athlete that for females, you can't just use, are you getting your period as the measure? Because then what do you do with a guy that has reds? Right. Like he's never... He's never going to have a period. So like, what's your measure? You have to be paying attention and coaches, nutritionists, sports physiologists, everybody, the athletes themselves. But again, you're hiring these people. Mm-hmm. It's their job to look for these things and and throw the red flags up. Um, because I like I know for me, like 100% reds just was missed because I could say uh, more regularly than not, I had a cycle that it would disappear maybe here and there right before a marathon. But as soon as I ran the marathon, right. I'm back on the horse. Everything's fine. Yeah. So that would be my, the biggest thing. We, we, you know, these discussions and, you know, me too movements and starting to look at the coaches and, you know, coaches might start losing their jobs or have be held to higher standards with, they should be. Yeah, with mm-hmm. safe sport. But in terms of athlete wellness and health, you have to be looking at more signs than here's my food diary that an athlete could or couldn't have lied on, <laughs> or here's my food diary, but you don't know that I'm actually sneaking in extra training sessions, mm-hmm. or yeah. um, here's my, you know, I, my blood work, here's my, I get my period every month. Like there's like research reds and it's only, it's fairly new. It's a newer term that people are talking about. It's a newer syndrome, but it's real. And I wouldn't be surprised if all of us in this room haven't suffered from it at some phase without Mm -hmm. being fully aware or knowledgeable of it. And in terms of um, the culture, I also think coaches both setting an example and paying attention to how their athletes talk about their bodies and behave Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is huge. And like you said, ordering lettuce and a water at dinner is something that I've watched happen on my team. And I thought, that's not great, but no one says anything. Right. Or even when you're having team dinners, get dessert. Like every <laughs> like every varsity team has team dinners now and again. Order dessert. Encourage your athletes to eat it. When you're at practice and you hear people talk about how lean they were, that's something that was talked about at my practices. Listen for that. Mm-hmm. Bank it. Put the, put the wheels in motion to get that at least addressed and then dealt with if it needs to be. Because I think that there are all of these signs are there and it's whether or not you choose to see them. Mm-hmm. So I'll just, I think, kind of echo and sum up what you're both saying, which is we need a person first approach and we need a holistic and long-term view of health and success. I think that um, often with these coaches, you're either compartmentalized to your high school coach and then you move on to a university coach and then you have a pro coach. You and I have both been lucky. Well, actually, all three of us have been lucky that we've had crossover within those categories, but I think a lot of people don't have that. And so, again, it can be easy to, again, even 
unintentionally, inadvertently neglect some of those links. But if we can have a system that is set up to train our coaches, we need coaching, coaches coaching, you know, (laughs) we need for our coaches to be coached around these things, but we also need them to just take a step back fairly regularly, take a look at their athletes and the culture they're developing and say, am I setting my, my athletes up for success and happiness and health for the rest of their lives? And I think the answer, if the answer is no, then get out of coaching (laughs) because there's many other people willing to step in and make the right choices. There are lots of resources available around this stuff. If you're an athlete, if you're a coach, if you're a parent, look into, if you're a coach, there's lots of coaching programs that are offered that are subsidized. There's a new um, sort of commitment to safe sport as part of the coaching training that's now available at the provincial and national levels. If you're a parent, check out the Athletics Canada website. We'll link it on this right up as well, but there is a safe sport column. I will say um, every sporting system can do a better job, but Athletics Canada was one of, I think, only seven or eight NSO in all of Canada to sign the safe sport commitment right out the gate. So can we be doing better? Yes. But are we at least making a commitment right away to holding our coaches and our sporting system to a higher standard? I also think yes. Make sure that you're educating yourselves. Um, Read Maddie's story. I highly encourage it. Follow our lovely guest, Lanny, on social media. Lanny, where can people find you? I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. That's your handle. Lanny Marchant. It's just me. Pretty Um, straightforward. I'm the only one. (laughs) (laughs) The OG. (laughs) So thank you again, Lanny, so much for coming and being part of this really important conversation. And we hope to see you on that start line in Tokyo next year. Yeah, me too. Thanks. For the extended rundown for the week of November 25th, I'm Kate. And I'm Maddie. And I'm Lanny. We'll be back with more next week.